All right, we're glad to see you tonight by way of live streaming, and uh, well, certainly it's an exciting time Wednesday night to be able to have Bible study and prayer together. Uh, we just want to let you uh, greet a few of our visitors tonight. We're glad they came out. We want you to make them feel welcome. So Tommy's going to stand around so you can see who they are. And uh, even in the coronavirus situation, uh, they came out and braved the storm so that they could worship the Lord together with us. And so we want you to uh, celebrate Christ and be able to enjoy our service tonight. And uh, I don't know who brought them in, but somebody brought them in. Amen. And so uh, we're glad to have them here also. Uh, a couple announcements. Remember, on our website, there is our um, prayer sheet. And the prayer sheet has a missionary letter on the back. And make sure you go on our website, look underneath the tab that says Our Church. And scroll down and you'll see the prayer sheet. And take time and pray for each of these folks that are on the sheet. Uh, that'll be a blessing. God will hear our prayers and he'll answer always in accordance with his will. And he gives us a great privilege of entering into that relationship with a, a prayer answering God. And so make sure you take time uh, this evening and certainly each day in your devotions uh, to pray for these individuals. Remember Friday night, Good Friday, that's this Friday at 6 o'clock. I'll have a message, a Good Friday message. And uh, I'm going to be preaching a message entitled Christ in Suffering. And so I want to encourage you to tune in Friday night at 6 o'clock. And then Sunday, remember at 9.30 in the morning, we'll have our discussion panel with the pastoral staff. Again, It's uh, we've been having a lot of fun with that. And I've been receiving a lot of positive comments that folks have been blessed through our study and certainly, if you have a question, you can send that to us via email or by private messaging on uh, Facebook, or you can uh, uh, text us, whatever way works for you. And we'd be glad to answer your questions. But So that's Sunday morning at 9.30 discussion panel. At 10 o'clock will be the preaching service. And uh, we have some special things planned for this Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. It's uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, it's the high day of worship for the Christian uh, because Jesus Christ arose out of the grave and because he arose, then we too are going to have eternal life and, uh, and be able to enjoy a resurrection one day. And so that's be taking place at 10 a.m. Then at 5.30, we have a devotional uh, for you. Uh, then at 6 o'clock in the evening, we have a preaching service uh, once again on Easter Sunday. So we want you to uh, make yourself available for all these different times of preaching and studying the Word of God. Uh, we want you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and these are great positive ways uh, that you can do that. Well, tonight we want to do a study entitled Communion in Suffering. We're going to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles and you have your family gathered together, and uh, you guys are ready to uh, do a study in the Word. Uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 3 and read down to verse 8. It says, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, Amen. who comforteth us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, communion in suffering. Let's pray. 
God, thank you so much for this time we could be together tonight. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that we have a God in heaven who is aware of every trouble and every trial and every difficulty that we face in our life. And, and there's nothing that, that comes into our life at any moment, at any time that you're not aware of. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us to be mindful of not just our experiences and our heartaches and our joys, but that we'd be mindful of the heartaches and experiences and joys in other folks. And Lord, I pray that we might be comforted of God so that we can be a comfort to someone else. And so speak to us in a special way as we study tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our text verse is verse four. It says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Communion in suffering. You know, suffering is common uh, to each of us. When we think about it being common, that just means it's a saying. And oftentimes I've had people say, well, you just don't understand how I feel or what I'm going through. I may not have the exact experience that you have, but the Bible reveals that the sufferings and the trials and difficulties we go through are common one towards another. And so they're the same. But it's also this suffering that is common is also comprehensive. That means everyone. Uh, there is not one person on the face of this earth that has not gone through some type of trial or some type of suffering or some type of difficulty in their life. And so when we talk about communion and suffering, we're talking about those things that we have in common in reference to every one of us experiencing those very things. We certainly see that taking place right now in the world in which we live with this COVID-19 a virus. You know, the, the amazing thing is it doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're poor, this, this, listen, this virus is no respecter of persons. There's rich people, there are poor people who are suffering because of this. It doesn't matter whether you're a politician or a laborer. Uh, the suffering and the difficulties that we face are the same, male and female, racial or national. It does not matter because across the lines of race, across the borders of nations, uh, we are experiencing the same suffering and the same difficulties. You can be a professional person or a homeless person, and yet we have this common suffering amongst us. Uh, you can be an actor or you can be a farmer. It doesn't matter this, this virus, COVID-19, is not concerned about that. Uh, it just takes whoever it will at the opportunity that it has. Christian and atheists alike are facing the trial of dealing with the corona uh, virus, uh, COVID-19. And so I wanted to share this message tonight in reference to us learning and understanding how we can deal with the communion of suffering. How can we deal with the things that we have in common, even though we're different? We have things that are in common when it comes to this matter of suffering. Uh, you know, scripturally, I thought of this. You know, Adam and Eve lost a son. There's someone that I'm preaching to tonight who has lost a, a family member, who has lost one of their children. In Genesis 4 and verse 8, it says, And Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. I often think about the heartache of Adam and Eve. Oh, we preach on the sin of Adam and Eve when we pre preach on the separation between Adam and Eve and their God. But wait a minute, what about the suffering? What about the sorrow that they experienced because they lost a child? And uh, so Adam and Eve lost a son. I thought about Joseph. He lost his family. In Genesis 37 and 28, it says they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. Now here's Joseph, he's all he's guilty of is revealing to his family things that God had revealed to him. 
But Joseph has lost his family. He's in a time of suffering and sorrowing because of the resentment of the revelation of God in his life. And his brothers plot on how to get rid of him. And instead of murdering their brother, uh, they sell him into the Ishmaelite caravans and he is taken down into Egypt. He lost his family. There's many a person I'm talking to tonight that you have some family member that has abandoned you. You have some relationship in your family that has broken down and it has broken your heart. And you say, nobody understands what I'm going through, but I want you to know this, that communion in suffering is that we suffer the very same things. Not only do we see Adam and Eve losing a son and Joseph lost his family, well, we see that Job lost his health wealth and his family. In Job chapter three and verse 26, Job said, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Oh, we know the story of Job and we know how he was accused of the devil. We know how God had given freedom to the devil to try Job. And Job, listen, he said, I did nothing wrong. I wasn't looking for trouble. I wasn't looking for situations. To, to I'll, uh, I'll deal with trouble, but yet in my quiet spirit, trouble still came. We look at this COVID-19 situation. Nobody was looking for this virus to come upon us. No one was thinking about the fact that all, all of a sudden, everything in America would be shut down. Uh, certainly, we weren't looking at and being concerned about what our life would be like in May but I'll tell you what, right now, we're concerned about what is our economy going to be in May? What is our health situation going to be in May? What is our family situation going to be like in May? Uh, we Listen, we weren't looking for trouble, but trouble came. Oh, Job lost his health, wealth, and his family. You know, Jeremiah lost his freedom. In Jeremiah 38 and 6, it says, Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon. There was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. He lost his freedom. Why? Because of preaching a message that the people of God did not want to hear. Isaiah the prophet had preached a message to be warned that God's judgment was coming on Israel. And Israel would not repent. They would not get right with God. And so Jeremiah comes along and it preaches a message that it's too late. God's judgment is already on us. And I'll tell you what a horrible place it would be to realize that it's too late to get right with God. Realize that it's too late to be able to experience the manifold blessings of God again. And as a result of it, Jeremiah was thrown into prison. I thought about the prodigal son who lost his wealth. In Luke 15 and 13, it says in there, there he wasted his substance with riotous living. I, I just wonder, I just wonder how many people have, uh, are in a situation where they cannot care for their family and cannot continue go, going ahead from this point because you've wasted your finances. You've wasted your substance. You've wasted your life. You've wasted what God has given you with riotous living. And now you're looking at it and say, I don't know how I'm going to be able to deal with this. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody's experienced what I've experienced. But yet there's multitudes of people tonight that are having common suffering, that same suffering that you're having. And I thought about Stephen. Stephen lost his life. Stephen, what a great uh, pre a preacher of the word of God. What a great deacon uh, in the early church. And it says in Acts 7 and 59, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And there's been many a person who has lost their life because of their faithfulness to proclaim who Christ is. And so communion and suffering, it tells us in our text verse, who comforted us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 
See, God can uh, comfort us in our times of trouble because there's not anything new under the sun. The things that have been experienced in the past are things that will be experienced in the future. The things that you may be suffering now, someone else has already suffered. I remember that we have to be concerned about the fact that the day of trouble is when we need to turn to our God. Dr. Tom Malone always used to say, God will never do for you what you can do for yourself. And I just believe, I just believe with all my heart that we are, listen, the things that we can do to care for ourselves and get through the times of trouble is to trust in the living God. I'm not looking to Washington, D.C., nor the president, or nor the local authorities, nor our governors or our mayors. I'm not looking to them for an answer in reference to the suffering that we're experiencing right now in America. I'm looking to God who will tell me that he'll take care of me if I'll do what I can do to be able to deal with the suffering and help someone else in the suffering, that God will take care of everything. That's why our verse says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God does not comfort us in our troubles just to be able to consume it upon ourselves. God comforts us in our troubles so that we might be an encouragement and a comfort to others, communion and suffering. I'm so thankful for uh, phone calls I've received and for acknowledgments that I've heard of people reaching out to other people to be a help. And I just know this, if God is comforting your soul, there is something that you have gone through that someone else is going through and you can mutually encourage them and comfort them in this time of great need. So communion and suffering. There's three things I want to look at tonight. First of all, I want us to understand purposeful suffering. I want purposeful suffering. By that, I mean this, that for every time of suffering that we go through, everything that we go through, God has a plan and a purpose for it. And I've often thought of this and learned and tried to learn this lesson, that if I'm going through a time of trial and difficulty, it is because of the fact that God wants to teach me something. And I've just learned over the years that I've just acknowledged, well, God, I'm going through this and I don't understand why I'm going through this. I realize somebody else has already gone through this, but what is the lesson you want me to learn? Because if I go through the trial and come out on the other side without gaining a knowledge of who my God is and how he can work in my life, I've failed in the trial. So purposeful suffering. Why? Because first of all, it reveals the mercy of God. Every time we go through a trial of difficulty, it reveals the mercy of God. That's why verse three says, blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And so when we go through a time of suffering, it is for us God is revealing his mercy to us. I'm thankful tonight that I don't receive everything that I deserve. I'm thankful that the mercy of God withholds what I deserve and gives me the grace of God to enjoy something that I don't deserve. Right. And every trial and every a time of suffering reveals to us the mercy of God. I, I just want you to know his mercies are renewed every day. I want you to know that his mercy is sufficient to give you peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. His mercy is abundant and his grace is full to help us to get through when we think that God's comforting us for the opportunity to be a comfort to someone else. Will you take the mercy of God and extend that mercy to someone else? Amen. It reveals the mercy of God. It fulfills the promise of God. That's why in verse 4, it says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, here it is, uh, this matter of the promise of God, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The amazing thing is this, that God has promised that he would give us the ability 
to be an encouragement and help to someone else. I, I know when I first got saved and I got went off to Bible college and I went into ministry, I, I really had a difficult time uh, trying to understand that I could be a help and encouragement to someone else. I didn't see myself as being knowledge, knowledgeable in the scriptures. And the longer I'm saved, I find that I'm more and more ignorant of the scriptures. But I found this, that God will allow us to go through situations and trials in our life so that he can fulfill his promise in us as he comforts us, then we can be a blessing to someone else. In John 16, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. And so when we go through the trials and difficulties in this world we live in, uh, God is going to fulfill his promise to you. You need to find a promise in the word of God. Find something that God wants to speak to you about what you're facing right at this moment in time, and God will fulfill that promise. In Romans 8, 17, it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. I love that because we are heirs of all that God is and all that God has because we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And then he says, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, the, the, the amazing thing is this, Christ did suffer. So I'm gonna preach, I got a whole message I'm gonna preach on on Friday night on Christ in suffering. And if Christ, listen, if Christ suffered, and we're joint heirs with Christ, then we'll suffer alongside with him. There, we don't like to talk about that as Christians, about suffering. We've been so consumed with this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that we have forgotten this, that God does call on his children to suffer for his namesake. Mm. Jesus said, take up the cross and follow me. We have a beautiful cross hanging up here in the back of me, and we look at it, but really, when he said, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't talking about a glorious, beautiful cross like that. He was talking about the form of torture and torment. He was talking about a, 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 an experience uh, that would rattle the mind of any person who was trying to fathom and understand and comprehend the suffering of being nailed to the cross. He said, take up your cross. Why? Because as we are joint heirs with Christ, we are also to suffer with Christ. And so in this world we live in, you're not going to escape suffering. Right. Because God allows us to go through suffering to experience Christ. The comfort wherewith the Father comforted the Son is the same comfort that he comforts us. And the comfort we're comforted of, we comfort someone else. Communion and suffering. He says that we may be also glorified together. Just because you suffer, just because you go through tragedy, tra tragedies and difficulties in your life does not mean you're not going to experience the glory of God. I understand the longer I'm saved, the more I see things going on. When in the book of Revelation, the apostle John at the end of Revelation cried out, even so come Lord Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that he cried out, even so come Lord Jesus, because he had just received the revelation of Jesus Christ that outlined and gave the details of the suffering that would be going on in this world. And I, I tell you, I have to say amen. Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. Why? Because there's trials and tribulations that we go through that are mutual one of another, but the suffering that we enjoy together with Christ does not hinder the glory that we'll have when Jesus Christ takes us to heaven. So I see the purposeful suffering is that it reveals the mercy of God. It fulfills the promise of God. And then it extends the experience of God. In verse four, the last part, it says, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So this matter of extending the experience of God. You know, it's one thing for us to be a comfort to someone else and someone to be a comfort to us. 
But this whole process of God comforting us in all of our trials and tribulations is that we might be able to experience who he is. I'm going to tell you, we serve a wonderful God. We serve right. a glorious Savior. Uh, we serve a God who is still on the throne of heaven, right. who has created this world. And I'm going to tell you, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he said that, he already knew that in 2020, there would be COVID-19 virus. Right. And so through this time of suffering, it is our obligation to be able to experience God. Now, I want you to know that God will come in your life and God can work in a powerful way. Acts 26, 23 says that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto his people and to the Gentiles. Why? Christ died, he suffered on the cross and was buried and he rose again for this reason that we might be able to experience who God is. Now listen, there's somebody, there's somebody that is hurting. Maybe your neighbor, maybe a family member, maybe acquainted, somebody you know that is hurting and suffering and they have no idea who God is. Now, folks, I'm telling you, this, this is an opportunity right. that God has brought in our life to mutually in common reality suffer with one another so that we could be a comfort to someone else and there is comfort when they experience who God is. So I see number one, this communion in suffering is purposeful suffering. Number two, in verse five, I see it's proportional suffering. So it's not just purposeful. In other words, God has a plan and a purpose for why we suffer. But it's also proportional. In verse five, notice what it says. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So he's saying it's proportional. As the sufferings of Christ is equal or in proportion to the consolation that abounds in Christ. So this matter of suffering is proportional in our suffering. And I thought of this, it deals with the loss and increase. Loss is suffering, the increase is blessing. But all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter six, Deuteronomy chapter six in verse three, we see a comparison here of blessings and loss. See, the suffering is always counted as a loss. But when God moves in the midst of the suffering, uh, there is the increase or the blessing. In Deuteronomy chapter six and verse three, it says, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that thou may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Now you understand, you understand tonight that they just came out of Egypt. You understand tonight that they have suffered 430 years. 400, 430 years, they were in bondage. And God is simply saying this, that the suffering you went through, the loss in Egypt, is equivalent to the gain that you're going to experience in Canaan land. Now, when you deal with suffering, you have to acknowledge the fact that it is proportional. And so whatever the suffering is you're going through, I want you to know this, God has something on the other side. Whatever it is that's robbing you of the joy of the Lord, whatever it is that, that has gripped you and you've lost, I believe that God has something greater. Financially, many people are getting ruined. I know this, that if we walk with God, that we can still experience the blessings of God. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give it in thy bosom. I'm not saying that for the purpose of getting an offering. I'm saying that for the purpose of saying that where there is a loss, there is a proportional increase. And the children of Israel had to learn that in their time of suffering would be in reference to the proportion of their loss 
would be equal to the increase that they would have in their life. And I know this, that God has something he wants to do in your life tonight in blessing you through the suffering that you're going through. It's not all loss. There's a place where God enters in and gives the increase. Right. So it's proportional in suffering. I see not only loss versus increase applied, I see sorrow versus joy applies. You know, in Psalm 30 and verse 5 it says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. The weeping at night is, is the loss. The weeping at night is the suffering. But the joy in the morning is the increase, and it's the blessing of God. The amazing thing is this, that God always gives a blessing when we go through the sorrow, acknowledging his purpose in that suffering. And so I want to be a comfort and a help to someone else. And so I have to acknowledge the fact that the sufferings of Christ do not outweigh the consolation of Christ. They are proportional one towards another. In other words, this, folks, what I need right now in my life, because my heart may be hurting and my life may be aching and my hope may be waning, what I need tonight, God will give me in proportion to the suffering that I'm going through so that I can be a comfort and help to someone else. So I see proportional suffering. In reference to loss versus increase, in reference to sorrow versus joy, in reference to pain versus blessing. Look over in 2 Kings chapter 4. This is going to take a moment and look at 2 Kings chapter 4. And when we look at 2 Kings chapter 4, we read of a woman who had no children, and God would bless him through Elijah to have children. And uh, as a result of, through Elijah, I'm sorry, uh, literally the child that he rece she received will end up dying. And it tells us that uh, in uh, verse 17 through 20, uh, the child dies. And, and so she wants her husband to send to uh, the prophet to bring him to deal with the death of uh, her son, and uh, she's longing for him to be restored. Uh, she did not have a son, and now she's upset with the prophet because of the fact that he gave her something that now she has lost. But the interesting thing is this, in 2 Kings chapter 4, in verse 26, she says, run now, I pray thee, to meet her. This is Elijah telling his servant, and say to her, is it well with thee? That's an important question. She has just went through a time of suffering because her son has died. And Gehazi comes to greet her and he comes there and Elijah says, this is the question that you're asked. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? And look at this answer. She answered, it is well. My question is this. When everything that you hope for is gone, can you still say it is well? She's acknowledging the fact that all things are well. I believe she had faith to believe that the God of Elisha was going to intervene on her behalf and restore her son. And so pain versus blessing. Go down into verse 32 of that same chapter, and the story continues. It says, And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and laid upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. 
And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. I will just want you to know this, that the pain that this woman was feeling, the sorrow that she was going through, the loss that she had experienced was changed into a blessing because of the fact that she believed in the living God that God could meet her needs at the time when she had no control over her situation. And with this COVID-19, it's as if we have no control over anything. But I want you to know my God can breathe life into our lives and into those that we love. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Why? Because there's a communion in suffering. A communion in suffering in that when one believer in the church is hurting, the whole church hurts. And you may be suffering tonight loss. You may be experiencing sorrow. You may have great pain tonight. I want you to know this. As believers in Christ, we're aching and hurting with you. And we want to be a blessing and we want to comfort you. Because the comfort that God has comforted us is the same comfort that you experience. So I see this, communion and suffering. There's a purposeful suffering. God has a plan. God has a purpose. There's a proportional suffering. In other words, the great suffering that you may go through is going to reap a greater blessing in your life because of God's working. And then the last thing is this. I see personal suffering. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation personal suffering. Notice, first of all, it's to overcome the terror. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Overcoming the terror that we face. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 14 says, but if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, folks, that's an amazing thing. Paul would say we're troubled on every side. And it seems like many times when we go through trials and difficulties, we're troubled on every side. And we become overwhelmed with the terror of the unknown. We don't know how it's going to unfold. We don't know how it's going to come out. But wait a minute. The personal suffering that you are going through and experiencing is common to the faith. It's common to other believers and know this, that there are others who are suffering with you and you can overcome the terror. I don't have to be well overwhelmed with fear. I don't have to be afraid to live my life because my life is hid in Christ. And if it's hid in Christ, I will be done, oh God. So it's personal suffering. Overcome the terror. Acknowledge God's will. Verse 6 in the middle of the verse which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, which walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 1. I want you to know tonight that God has a will and a plan for you, and it does not matter what your suffering may be, God will accomplish that, that uh, suffering. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would cry out to the Lord, his Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. But immediately he would follow up, nevertheless, thy will be done. And I'll tell you, I'm not morbid tonight. I don't like pain and I don't like suffering. And I don't want to experience loss. But if God wants us to go through personal suffering, if for no other reason, 
than to learn how to be comforted by others, I say, Lord, thy will be done. First Peter 3, 17 says, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And during these times of great trouble, let's remember this, the personal sufferings we go through, we can overcome the terror and we can acknowledge God's will. And then in verse seven, I see the confidence in God's care. It says, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. God will watch care over you. Casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. I don't want you to think for one moment, not just for one moment, not for a second. I don't want you to ever think that God doesn't care for you because of what's going on in the world that we live. God cares for you. There's confidence in his care. He says, I'm confident that really, listen, the suffering you're going through is going to be equal to the blessing that you're going to enjoy, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 19 says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God is faithful to us. Man. He created us in his image. He saves us for his glory. And he keeps us secure in all that he is, communion and suffering. And some concluding thoughts here. Look at verse eight. It says, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. I want you to see that trouble comes. This is the apostle Paul writing. It's very easy to look at someone that may be spiritual or a leader in spiritual things or someone who has been saved a long time and think, well, uh, they don't have to worry about things. They got everything together. They don't have any problems at all. And Paul says this, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. Even though I'm the apostle Paul, even though I wrote two thirds of the New Testament, even though God saved me on the Damascus road and God called me to preach his word, even though God did all these things, trouble still came. And so trouble will come. And trouble cannot be always understood. Because in verse 8, he says, and that we were pressed out of measure. In other words, he said this, that things were out of control. I don't understand why it came. I don't know why this happened. I don't understand that at this point in my life, this is taking place. I was thinking the other day, I'm 68 years old, or will be in May, Lord willing, 68 years old. And I thought over my lifetime. And I, I literally had this thought. Why did this have to happen in my lifetime? I just as soon wait to let the next generation deal with it. You say, well, you're a terrible preacher. No, not I'm being honest with you tonight. I don't relish the fact of suffering. I don't relish and, and enjoy the difficulties that we have to go through. And yes, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. Why trouble came and is pushed out of measure. It's beyond our control. And why it had to come at this moment in time in history. I don't know. Trouble comes and trouble cannot be understood. But trouble always goes beyond our ability. He says, not only was it pressed out of measure, but above our strength. I mean, the pressure's on. I mean, it's a full press right now. And Christians understand this. Yes, trouble is upon us, and yes, we don't understand everything about it, but wait a minute, there it goes beyond our strength, and it is time for believers to stand up for God and rest in the power of God and understand there's a full press going on, and when the going gets tough, how are we, the believers in Christ, are going to stand? Not only does trouble not cannot be understood, and trouble goes beyond our ability, but trouble creates the um, depression, despair, I'm sorry, despair. It says, in so much that we despaired even of life. That's the Apostle Paul. That's the Apostle Paul saying it was so bad, it was so out of control, it was so confusing that I literally thought of ending my life. 
I despaired of life itself, and yet people are going through trials and difficulties, and people are coming to a point of despair. They were saying that they're concerned about this whole situation, that suicide's attempts will go up. The Christian does not have to despair of life because when the trouble is beyond our strength and beyond our ability and beyond our understanding, there is still a God in heaven who can comfort us in all of our tribulation. Right. That's why in verse 11, the trouble is defeated. Notice in verse 11, it says, ye also helping together by prayer for us. Paul says, I'm thankful that you didn't turn your back on me. I'm thankful that you helped me. It says, ye also helping together. How did it help? By prayer. Oftentimes people say, I just want to do something. I just want to help. Is there anything that I can do? And you think, well, there's nothing you can do. Wait a minute. When things are out of control and beyond our ability, remember this, that you can help together. We're in this together. We're communing one with another in suffering. And we may not be at the same location physically, but bless God in our heart and our spirit. We're one with Christ and we need to pray for one another. Amen. He says, for that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. What was he saying? We were just in communion together with suffering. John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And I like that because the word comforter, the Greek is parakletos. Parakletos means one who comes alongside in the time of need. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Now I just know this, the comforter, the Holy Ghost of God indwells the believer. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And I want you to know when you feel like there's no one with you, Christ is with you. When you feel like there's no comfort, there is the comforter who abides with you forever. When you feel like you can't understand what God's promise is and what he's doing, it is the comforter of God that will reveal all that Christ has revealed to us. Why? Because we're, in, we're in one. We're in communion together in the suffering. We are not alone. You might be sitting in your house right now and you might be there all by yourself and there's not one living soul that's with you. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is with you. Amen. I want you to know that in prayer, we're with you. Amen. I want you to know that when Paul says, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we, we ourselves are comforted of God. I want you to know there is comfort in Christ tonight. Amen. And it is the Holy Spirit of God that brings that comfort to our soul. And I want you to know that, wait a minute, you may be going through personal suffering, each one of us are, but it's, listen, it's not unique to us. We all go through the same sufferings. There's proportional suffering. Realize this, what you're losing right now, what you're feeling right now, God's going to give you greater and beyond tomorrow. And it's purpose, purposeful suffering. We're not just suffering for the sake of suffering. We're suffering for the glory of God, communion in suffering. Be sure to pray these folks on our prayer list. Be sure to take our membership directory and go through that and pray for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of Ocean County Baptist Church. Be sure to uh, take time and, and go over this lesson again and ponder those verses of how great a God that we have that he would comfort us in all of our tribulation. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful uh, for grace tonight. We're so thankful, Lord, that we have a God who is a living God, and we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ this Sunday, the joy that God is real and God is alive and God gives us life that's everlasting. But tonight, Lord, there's somebody that's really struggling. 
Uh, they're really having a hard time with this, Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit of God, will you speak to them? Holy Ghost of God, will you anoint them from God, the Father in heaven? Will you impress upon them your presence in a way that gives them comfort to their soul? And God, I pray if there's some way that we, in a tangible way, can be a help to one another, give us that opportunity. But most of all, God, give us a spirit of prayer and intercession and supplication for one another, oh God. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.